Good morning, I'm Jim Campanini, the editor of The Sun, and we're happy to welcome State Auditor Suzanne Bump with us today. Uh, she's uh, running for re-election for State Auditor, and uh, we'd like to talk to her about the issues. Why don't you just give us an update about some of the things you're working on and some of the things that are your priorities in this campaign. Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to come up here and speak with all of you and to, uh, to share uh, my uh, record and my views with the people of the Lowell area. Um, I'm running for, uh, for re-election as state auditor, uh, and I'm running on the basis of the record that I've compiled over the past four years. Uh, many years ago, I had served in the legislature, which gave me a grounding in government policy making. Uh, I was in the private sector for many years as an attorney, particularly working with, uh, with businesses, large and small. Uh, I was a small business owner because I had my own uh, firm at, uh, at one point. Uh, but I came back into government with Governor Deval Patrick, where I was the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. Uh, that gave me responsibility for uh, the operation of six eight different agencies, uh, uh, oversight over 1,500 people, and, uh, and also responsibility for uh, the administration of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, in that position, I became very focused, uh, naturally enough, on effective strategies to make the most out of our, uh, our dollars, particularly those dollars that were going into skills training, which was, uh, was a very important piece of how we grow our economy. Um, and I became concerned that uh, my agencies, and then as I looked more broadly, agencies across government weren't engaged in doing enough strategic planning so that we could look at our long-term needs, nor were they doing enough uh, by way of performance assessments to really look at the outcomes of spending, not just measuring what we spent, but measuring what we got for spending that money. And it was that those sets of concerns and those sets of priorities that compelled me to run for the position of state auditor. The state auditor's job is an essential one in the scheme of government because it provides the checks and balances on the spending in the judiciary and in the, ex the rest of the executive branch of government. Um, we don't have the statutory authority to audit the legislature, so that's, that's a part. So, Does anyone do that? Yeah, perhaps you should. The Inspector General's Well, office? actually, I do believe that the auditor should have the ability mm -hmm. to audit the legislature. Um, that was something that four years ago, uh, both my Republican um, candidate and, uh, and myself had said should be done, and I have supported the legislation that the Republicans have advanced over the uh, past two legislative cycles to do that. I've spoken with the Senate President and the uh, and the House Speaker about this, but there is, uh, uh, they're claiming uh, just institutional uh, rights to be beyond uh, scrutiny, uh, that, that just the, the power of their, of their branch, maintaining the prerogatives of their branch of government. But that said, there's more than enough for me to spend my time on uh, with the judiciary and the executive uh, branch of government, uh, as well as them folks who do business, contractors who do business with the government, uh, not just in providing goods like computer equipment, but also services like elder care and services to troubled uh, uh, teens and, and, uh, and troubled families. So the, the, uh, the uh, state auditor is the um, agent for accountability in government, making sure that all monies are, pro are properly accounted for, but also that public resources are being well used and that agencies are delivering on their commitments to provide the whole range of services that government provides, whether it's transportation or the administration of justice or education. You get the idea. So how many audits have you done in the last four years? You say? Um, I think that it's about 300. I don't know off the top of my head. And are they, uh, if you had to break them down in sectors, what, yeah. are the, what are the major sectors of those 300 audits, would you say? Well, they cover the whole wide range of government. We have, um, by agency, there are more um, audits that we have done of the Mass Health, the Medicaid program. Um, that's because we have an, an, a unit dedicated to the Mass Health program. 
the reason that we have a unit dedicated um, to mass health and which is it always in the process of uh, doing two or even three audits at a time is because mass health comprises one third of the state budget. Fully 33% of the state's 36, 38 billion dollar budget goes to the mass health program. And so when we look at mass health, we look at it in multiple ways. We look at its administration. So one of our audits looked at how well they were doing verifying the income and residence um, eligibility of people who were applying for benefits. Um, we also looked at its, uh, its uh, system of uh, payments for services. One of the areas of service that we looked at was uh, their payments for drug screenings, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, substance abuse screenings. Uh, and we found that they were paying for, uh, for screenings for, uh, for alcohol, which don't get detected in, a, uh, in the, in the uh, tests that they were, uh, that they were paying for. Um, they were allowing them to be used multiple times in the course of a week when that is not medically indicated and it's contrary to, um, to standards for that. Um, they were paying for drug screenings that were part of uh, probation uh, conditions and you're not, they weren't supposed to be doing that. So, so they, we were able by pointing that out for them to change their system and stop making those payments and therefore save millions of dollars. Um, and we also look at providers of, under the Mass Health program. Uh, we have found uh, dentists, for instance, who were guilty of billing for services never performed or overbilling, uh, and then also dentists who were actually endangering the health of the little kids they were treating because they were subjecting them to multiple unnecessary full mouth x-rays and fluoride treatments, really, to the point where they were harming the, the child. And when we find fraud like that, uh, we work with the Attorney General's office to, to bring those folks to Can uh, you to name justice. an audit um, of, of the number of audits that you mentioned in response to Jim's question, which audit had the, had the biggest bang for its buck? I mean, have you had an audit that resulted in indictments? Or have you had an audit that has resulted in a, you know, a wide-ranging change of, of doing business? Well, um, it, it, there are lots of ways to look at this. So, uh, one that made uh, that that probably identified uh, the biggest uh, dollar-wise mm -hmm. pro prom problem in state government was of the MBTA. They had instituted a new automated fair collection system. Mm -hmm. They spent over the course of years, I think over the course of seven years, mm -hmm. ninety-four million dollars installing it and then trying to get it to work properly. Mm -hmm. We looked at the uh, at the uh, at its operation over its uh, seven years, and we found that it couldn't accurately count the day's receipts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it would be way off, um, according to what they actually gave to the mm -hmm. bank. Some you know, uh, be be way up. Other days it would be way way down. Mm -hmm. What we detected was over a hundred million dollars that couldn't be accounted for because the system didn't work. This was as a result of the fact that years ago, back in the, the Romney administration, the board rushed the system into operation without doing the testing on it first. And they also voted, actually they voted to do that, and they voted to relieve the contractor of any warranty obligations. That is to fix the system <laughs> if it didn't work when it went in place. So that exposed um, a major system failure because if you can't count your money, then you don't know if it's being stolen. And what did the MBTA do in response to your audit? They finally fixed it. They finally determined that the uh, the problem was that when they were taking the day's receipts out um, at the end of the day, the systems were not setting themselves back to zero. And so you would have wildly different um, uh, 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 counting of the day's receipts. So that that's a big dollar, big dollar item. Um, I think I, an audit that has caught uh, that caught a lot of attention and is the one that uh, received the most pushback from the governor and from my colleagues, uh, my Democratic colleagues in the legislature, was one that I did of the Department of Transitional Assistance. Uh, there weren't tremendous amounts of money that were involved, 
but we decided to look at the ability of that agency to fight fraud. How well were they doing in screening out people who weren't truly eligible for the benefits, and then how well were they doing at detecting abuse of benefits by folks who were, were put on? And what we found was that they, uh, they weren't doing all of the checks of eligibility that they should have done. In fact, they weren't always doing the matching of social security numbers that an applicant would provide uh, with the social security system's so-called death master list. And so we found uh, over a thousand individuals and I think another thousand or more uh, dependents who were getting benefits based on the social security numbers of people who were dead, long dead, <laughs> long ago. So clearly they shouldn't have been mm -hmm. on benefits and that was a major mm -hmm. problem. Um, they also, the staff at, at the agency didn't know how to make use of the reports that their only own computer system would uh, spit out at the end of the month that could enable them to detect patterns of abusive benefits so that they weren't keeping track of the numbers of people who were using their benefits consistently out of state, for instance, or who were using all of their food stamp benefits uh, on the first day that, they, that the benefits got loaded into their account and were cashing them in at the local convenience store attached to a gas station which suggests that it's not being used to feed a family. Um, mm. so, so, that, um, so those were major flaws in their administration of that program. Um, the amount they of- been fixed? They are, um, they are being fixed. Uh, it is part of, uh, of a big overhaul of the administration of the program, but then also the legislature in this past session uh, used other things that they, problems they had detected with the program, as well as our audit recommendations to do reform legislation. Uh, many of the things that we identified in our audit by the time the audit was released uh, were already being fixed because while we were doing the audit, a new commissioner came on board. She was aware of what we were doing in our, uh, with our audit. Uh, we had already finished up the field work and she, so she said, I know you haven't written this up yet, but can you come in and tell me what I need to do? And so we had a list of, I think, 21 things that she needed to do. And so those were already in place as we were going forward. As I said, though, I received pushback from the governor um, and, from, uh, and from Democratic colleagues who said, oh, you shouldn't be making such a big deal about this. It's not that much money. The principle is there has to be integrity in that program. It doesn't matter how much money is actually involved, I mean, how much money you actually find that's been misspent, um, because it's also a matter of maintaining the public trust. People who legitimately need those programs need to have the public's support for those programs. And so this is fundamentally a matter of public trust. And that's how I view the work of the auditor's office. Who decides in the office um, whether a state agency like that, the one you just talked about, is going to be audited. So our mandate. What's the um, vetting process? So our um, my statutory responsibilities are, are two parts. One is that I am supposed to audit every state agency on a more or less rotating basis, mm -hmm. except for Mass Health, which we're constantly auditing, um, and that basis is a, but every three years. The reality is, we don't have the resources to do that. And you know what? And it also wouldn't be a good expenditure of our funds. Our other um, mandate is to audit to government standards. So I had a choice. Was I going to use our resources to do as many audits as I possibly could do, um, or was I going to meet government standards and do audits that went deeper and had more of an impact? I chose quality over quantity. And that's why we did a complete overhaul of the office um, and, and are doing audits, to answer your question, based on risk and relevance. So where, uh, which programs are the ones that are at greatest risk of going astray, misusing money, not, not bringing in all the revenue that they, uh, that they could, um, or, or at greatest risk of failing 
the public that they're supposed to be serving. So we do that through a pretty sophisticated um, uh, uh, analysis of, of spending, of payroll, of, tra of other transactions. We've got a, a couple of dozen factors, objective factors that we, that we look at, and we do it on the basis of relevance. So what, what is um, a topic of concern to the public? Uh, where there's, there, there's concern that something is going wrong in an agency. Where can we add value to a legislative discussion about a public policy issue? So that's another set of subjective factors that we, that we bring to it. But so that, just to give you, to illustrate, so in an effort to do quantity, the last time that the auditor's office had audited the Department of Transitional Assistance, they did a fairly quick, it was appropriate, but a fairly quick audit of whether there was an appropriate computer backup system if the system went down. We decided mm, that's, that's not a bad audit, but let's look at fraud fighting in the agency, uh, which required a greater you know, depth of investigation, um, a new skill set that we've brought to the office as well. Folks now have higher levels of education and, um, and varied background than they did uh, previously. They now get, uh, um, they get uh, 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 performance assessments at the end of every audit so we can figure out whether they're deficient in one particular aspect of the work that they were doing. Uh, we do annual performance evaluations now as well and have merit uh, uh, raises only. You only get a raise based on your uh, performance. So that's, that's a major strategic shift that we have made. Um, the result being that although we have done, in fact, fewer audits than had been being done on an annual basis before, we have identified record amounts of broken systems and misspending, abuse, and, and fraud. Uh, to the tune of some four hundred million dollars over the past over the past four, four years. years, that is that's unprecedented, and that's because we have made a deliberate choice of emphasizing quality, um, depth, uh, new skills in the office over quantity. Quantity. Just churning so, out a bunch of audits. So, if you had to rate Massachusetts government agencies based on your audits say uh, uh, a 10 being excellent performance down to one which is you know failing okay where does massachusetts government stand uh in that i mean 400 million dollars is a lot of money that can go to a lot of schools that teachers firefighters i mean i mean it's, it's just not something and you know i remember the, the, the governor's response to your, your thing he was very very casual about it like geez for all the things that we do you know, this thousand people, this really isn't. And, and, and I, it, it sparked more outrage. Uh, uh, but, uh, but so how would, you, how would you rate overall government I mean, performance? Well, it's, and there's a lot of good things that go on, no, but still, I mean, but it's very, they it's shouldn't very be these uneven. leak holes. They shouldn't be these leak holes. It's very, it's leak. What's No, leak. It's a leak. <laughs> just, but they're all over the place. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, but it's not uniform. Some agencies uh, we find do are doing a great job. We have what's, a, what's an agency that's doing a great job? Um, we have looked at. Um, I think let's see. Let's see. Well, you really got to struggle. No, so I'm just thinking of something recent that we did. Given the numbers of that we've done, it's hard mm -hmm. to it's hard to remember the one. So here we looked at. Um, we've just looked at how well. Um, uh, agencies, so state government as well as local governments, were doing combating the, uh, the epidemic of childhood obesity. Um, so we, in, it, it involved looking at the spending of money and the implementation of policies by uh, the Department of Transitional Assistance, uh, by the Department of Agricultural Resources, and the Department of Education. Uh, and we looked at school districts mm -hmm. to see whether they were complying with the new standards for nutrition, replacing junk food in their vending machines with healthy uh, food. And what we found was that there was a, a very high rate of compliance of spending the money appropriately, and we're actually getting results. Um, we found that one area where uh, there needs to be improvement, if we're really going to take a um, it be effective in reducing childhood obesity is to uh, increase the amount of physical activity 
um, takes place uh, during the, the school day. Um, some schools, if you can believe it, some schools will only provide kids with 22 minutes of physical activity during the course of a week. A co the course of a week. Um, those, of course, are the less resourced uh, gateway city schools where there are uh, where the schools are under resourced um, but unfortunately it's also where there is the greatest need for this because there are so few so many fewer healthy food options in low-income uh, communities so you need you need to have all these factors at play if we're going to reduce the rate of childhood obesity and there are multiple reasons why we need to do this I mean health obviously being one of them, and the expenses associated uh, with poor health and the early onset of heart problems and diabetes. Uh, well, which was uh, the agency, diabetes. though, that did so well? They all three, all, all of them combined were doing, were doing a good job. There was one exception. I just want to say, the other reason that we, that we care about this is because of um, the educational effects of, uh, of poor diet, um, poor nutrition, and lack of exercise. The, the, the area that we could, where we could see, who, uh, we think that there's more that can be done is, um, is in the relationship between the, uh, the food stamp program at DTA and the Department of Agricultural Resources, making um, uh, it possible for folks who do get food stamps uh, to make use of those at farmers markets. Um, there are costs associated with bringing them, you know, the machines in to do transactions. It has discouraged um, a lot of farmers markets from participating in the program. Um, so even as uh, through our nutrition programs at DTA, we're encouraging people to go there, they've got a financial barrier uh, to doing it. Um, so that's, that's an example. Now that is a kind of audit that never ever would have been performed before because they were only looking at single programs within single agencies. But we invested in an ability to pull in data from multiple sources now so that we can look more broadly at statewide efforts to address um, particular problems. All right, so we go back to my question. Overall, oh, oh. state go, one um, to 10. Overall, one to 10. Um, it's really, I, it's really not fair. It's not a ten. Um, it's I've not had a more zero. candidates say that to me. No, no. I, John well, Taney I mean, said that. Well, to no, me. no. It it's not. Question. It's not fair because the agencies vary so much. And I'll tell you. And some of them. But you're the um, auditor looking at this, looking at the, the broad picture of it. Um, probably a six or a seven. Okay. And you know why? But, but I'll tell, I'll give you an example of why I say that, because um, and people do not like to hear this. Um, uh, in fact, my opponent says that I shouldn't say these things, but if the results of an audit, um, like the results of the depart our audit of the foster care program of the mm -hmm. Department of Children and Families, if the results of our audit are that they can't properly protect kids uh, because they don't have enough social workers, the social workers don't have up-to-date case management uh, you know, computer programs, if there aren't enough uh, managers to oversee the work of the social workers, to see that kids are getting medical exams, that foster families are being properly screened, that you can identify where there is a foster family that, uh, who's a, had a, a household member who has um, had a criminal offender uh, background check uh, waived in order to, be, to get the kid into the program. If an agency is so severely under-resourced that it can't do its job, then I've got to be able to call out that agency. For some reason, my Republican opponent says, I shouldn't make recommendations to remedy deficiencies in the resources that agencies have. Um, but, but we are, I, m many, many of our audit findings now are because agencies don't have this basic infrastructure. So to me, you have to invest in accountability. Accountability isn't just saying after something has gone wrong in state government, oh really, I'm sorry I acknowledged that went wrong and I, I, I'll try not to do it again. To in, uh, invest in accountability means you have to have proper policies and procedures. You've got to have people overseeing 
compliance with those properties and uh, policies and procedures. You've got to have competent staff performing the agencies. You've got to have the technology to do the job, and you've got to have mm -hmm. honest systems, systems of performance assessment. Mm -hmm. And we are sorely lacking in all of those, in many of those areas from agency to agency. But don't you, don't you think that just, you know, your staff, that's commendable doing 300 audits, I believe, okay, in four years. Um, but, but just the idea that you can't get to everything, right. okay, doesn't that say the government's too big? I mean, it's grown too enormously? I no, mean, but, but no? The, um, there are agencies that don't need our attention mm -hmm. because the amounts of money are, are on, a, on a regular basis. I mean, they all need to be reviewed at some point, but they don't need it as frequently mm -hmm. as others because the risk of something going wrong there um, is so small. It's such a small piece of government, or it may already have its own oversight um, capabilities, and so we don't need uh, we don't need to focus the attention on it. Um, but but and you would not want to give the auditor the resources to do to audit every single entity every three years. So that's why not just my office, but the whole of the auditing profession, not just government auditing, but also mm -hmm. private auditing, it's focused on risk because no one ever has the resources to go everywhere that you could possibly go. So it's how do you make the best use of the resources that you have. So it's mm -hmm. part of a strategic plan that we have to focus on, on the quality of the audits, the competence of the staff, and the depth of the audits so that we can identify more opportunities to make government work. Madam Order, I would give you more money to do that, especially well, I, the I government, definitely government expanding by 10,000 workers over the last six years, okay? I would give you, no, not unlimited funds, but I yeah. would give you more money to find out what those 10,000 people are doing, okay? And the other thing is, uh, you know, government has a general accounting office, the federal government, right. okay? Now, they pass legislation, and there's guys like us in the media and, and some w good, uh, you know, think tanks out there who look at these bills, actually have experts who look at them and say, it's not going to work, it's going to be more expensive than you think it is, right. okay? And, and, and we don't have that set up. Like your, your auditing office, you have, unfortunately, after it's already passed and put in place. But uh, look at this uh, partner's agreement that the Attorney General, okay? Everybody's weighing in on it, say that, and already we've seen costs starting to rise, okay? Now, you had your thoughts on that, right? Didn't you have no, not on partners. No, okay, no you didn't audit not, it. But, no, no I have, and I have not opined on, well, you have on partners. Okay. No, I but have not. there's something where I would love the auditor's office to take a look at it in advance and say, you know, gee, how's this going to work? Because it's so, it's so unclear right now. Yeah. And, and it doesn't seem there's any restrictions on partners except to say they're going to put their hand up and say, I'll abide, okay? Yeah, you there, know? there are, clearly there are, um, there's more work that the auditor's office uh, can do, particularly now that we are expanding our skills and we have this investment in data analytics. We are going to be taking a, a larger role in healthcare because in 2012, the legislature passed a bill um, intended to reduce costs in health care uh, uh, and also improve quality and access. Um, they, are, they have mandated us to be the ones to determine whether that um, a law is, uh, is having the intended consequences. So we're having to do work in an area where we never have before, and that is in, in, in looking outside of government and looking outside of government spending to determine um, what impacts of a law are, law are on, on out-of-pocket expenses uh, by consumers, on uh, employer costs for insurance plans, on, uh, on the, the impacts on public health, uh, the impacts on the healthcare workforce, and the impacts on access to substance abuse and mental health services and services generally. That is a huge task for the state auditor's office to take mm -hmm. on. But thankfully, we'd already started going down this path of investing in this ability to do this an data analytics, to bring in information uh, from multiple different sources and ask meaningful questions of it uh, 
and, and, and be able to integrate all of this and come up with some answers. So we have had to, um, to hire some new talents, so folks who have done clinical research um, in the healthcare quality area. We've got an advisory group of, um, of hospital health insurance, consumer research groups, um, et cetera, uh, around the table who are um, helping making sure that we've identified all of the sources of data that we're going to need to, 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 uh, to pull into this. Um, and also figure out because the number of questions that you could ask to answer any one of these is countless. It, it is beyond comprehension. What are the what are the questions that we can ask that will give us the best insight of the of the thousands of questions that you could ask? What are the ones that are going to give us the best insight? So this is a project um, that is ongoing. We will be probably issuing some reports along the way. Um, our deadline for a report uh, of the assessment of, uh, of this is the first end of the first quarter of 2017. Mm. How many people does your office employ? So um, we have fewer people than we did when I started. Uh, we're, the legislature did give us some more money this year, so we are still hiring a new uh, group of auditors. Nine of them just joined us. There'll be another probably nine that are coming on board within the um, next few weeks, that will bring us up to 235, I think, 240. There mm -hmm. were over 300 when I took office. Our budget right now is lower than it was in 2009. So we are not in a And how do you explain of, those decreases in employment in the budget? Um, how, how do well, I... Well, why are they, why do you why have fewer lower? workers and why is the budget lower? Um, well, the legislature is in charge of, um, of our, our budget making. Um, the part of part of the explanation is that, that at the time, at back in two thousand nine, there was um, there was money that was uh, supporting the office that came through the federal stimulus act. Um, the auditor's office had specific um, uh, responsibility for ensuring that um, that the money under ARA was properly um, spent. So some of that. Is from that, but the other reason that we have fewer people is that a number of the people that were on there um, were part time, uh, and they really weren't adding any value to the office. Uh, they, in fact, were a drag on the office because they, they weren't properly trained to do to do the work. So, as soon as I walked in the door, um, a lot of those people went away. After the peer review and after we had been able to spend more time analyzing our needs, another group of people uh, went away. We had to, in order to attract quality people that had um, the skills that were required, because there were no educational requirements for the hiring of auditors when I took over. We obviously instituted by, by uh, saying went away, you mean you eliminated I, the I eliminated, yeah, they, they were terminated. So, um, they were terminated. Me, so, who audits the auditors? It is this, um, so a peer review is supposed to be done every three years um, by, under the auspices of the State Auditors Association. Uh, they, and, and a peer review is just, as the name implies, they select a group of auditors from other states to come in and, uh, and assess your staff competence, how well they are suited to do the job, uh, the uh, integrity, whether you have a quality assurance unit, so whether you have your own internal auditing, uh, whether you have <coughs> up-to-date policies and procedures, technology to go along with that, whether you are properly um, planning your audits, assessing risk, uh, conducting your audits, documenting every one of your findings, you know, is there evidence to support every word that you put in that, in that audit, um, and in 2011, when I came in, I asked for a peer review. As I said, it should be done every three years. It hadn't been done for more than 15 years. And so in 2011, the office failed. It's rare that an agency would completely fail an, uh, a peer review, but in 2011, it was determined that we were not auditing in the auditor's office to the standards. You mentioned the Government Accountability Office. They're the ones that set government auditing standards. So that meant that I had to totally upgrade the staff. I had to change all of our policies and procedures. I had to modernize. They were using an audit manual 
uh, that was 10 years old. Uh, it didn't, it wasn't meeting the requirements. Folks weren't, folks weren't being properly um, trained. And, and that's why, you know, another reason why the audits weren't having the same kind of impact that they're, that they're having now. Uh, so we made all of those change, changes internally. Uh, and even as we were going through all of this continuous change, we've been, we were able to identify over $400 million worth of problems throughout the rest of government. So in 2011, they come in, and I said, you know, every three years we're supposed to be peer reviewed. Um, so a, a group, again, um, through the State Auditors Association, came back in uh, the spring of this year. They reviewed all of the staff, all of their training. You have to be continuously trained. Even I go through professional education. Uh, anybody who touches an audit has to, uh, has to get um, continuing um, uh, professional uh, credits. Uh, and they looked at all of that. They looked at the, our training program, our quality assurance program. They looked at, uh, at, at a representative sample of audits from every aspect that we do, from, from little bitty agencies to big complicated ones, at any rate. So there were three things that could have happened. We could have failed. We could have passed with qualifications, which means you're largely compliant, but here are the areas that you've got to work on because you're consistently missing the mark in these areas, or you could pass with no deficiencies. And we passed with no deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So we went from being at the bottom to going to the top. So that, too, is something that is part of my record that I am, I am very proud of. And <clears> it's not just a source of personal pride. I mean, it's, it, I'm proud of the people in the office be, for being willing to, uh, to defy the stereotypes that many people have of public workers uh, and embrace change, uh, be willing to, to push themselves harder than they ever have before, um, and, to, uh, and, and to support one another in different ways. We now have more cross-unit collaboration than we ever did before, so that IT just doesn't sit in a room and keep a bunch of computer systems going. They are actively at the table when we are planning an audit so that we can have their input into how it is that our auditors should be testing the reliability of the data systems that we're going to be using. So they, they are an active, and they are working with them to improve the technology that we use, the electronic work papers that, that we keep. Um, you, you, you no longer keep paper records, except if you're you know, accepting evidence in, uh, on you, paper. You none of your employees carry guns like in the Inspector General's office, right? No, we do have a Bureau of Fraud Investi a separate unit Is apart you? from, uh, uh, from, uh, um, uh, from our audit reporters unit. reporters who work for the auditors, or, I mean, not the auditors, the Inspector General's office. Yeah, no, we have a Bureau of Special Investigations. They do public assistance fraud investigations, the individual cases where Somebody's gone on benefits, and the agency suspects they're not eligible, or, or they're or they're abusing benefits. We have a different group from our audit group that does that, but they're now collaborating with the audit um, team as well, so that we aren't just act reactive to a referral from an agency, but we're doing data and an analysis so that we can see patterns that that lead us to believe that there's abuse, okay. and then we can go after them. The, um, um, here's, not to interrupt you, but no. this, you, you raised a good point. When, when the state finally does get its Mass Connector website operating up to maximum potential, and we hope it is in November, okay? Um, yeah. Now, my suspicion, and a lot of people uh, who read The Sun, okay, suspect that there are a lot of people getting health insurance from the state of Massachusetts that don't deserve to be getting it, okay? And, um, or don't qualify for it, mm -hmm. let, me, let me say that, okay? Mm -hmm. Qualify for it. And it's just amazing that we had 97% covered universal health care that we started on our own side, and then we went to the uh, Affordable Care Act, and then for this extra 3%, we've now realized through uh, documents that have been released, okay, that we're into the hundreds of millions of dollars not for that website, just alone, the costs have increased, right. and they think it's because of that. Do you have your suspicions that when this gets up to date, because you know they haven't been really, they've been putting everybody on without really checking any qualifications. 
This was this was the waiver that they received from the federal right. government, and the governor made the decision to just put everybody on that. Right. Okay. So when the Health Connector website didn't work and people weren't able to access the programs they were to get insurance that they were supposed to if the website worked, you are right. A lot of people got moved into the Mass Health program, um, and it may well be that they weren't all. Uh, put in there appropriately and that they aren't being managed appropriately. Um, we will, in 2015, in the coming year, at some point be looking at some aspect of this. Um, the reason I say some aspect of it uh, is that we haven't determined it yet because what, what we're going to do is try to cover some ground that isn't already be co being covered. Martha Coakley already has an investigation into uh, the awarding and administration of the contract. I know that the, uh, that the Federal Health and Human Services um, Office of Inspector General is looking at another part of the program. So is the, um, the Center for Medicaid Services, again, the other, the, the oh, federal agency. So, so we're not gonna go in there and duplicate work that others have done, so we will go in and we will, you know, when others have defined what they're looking at and what their conclusions are. We'll see what kind of value uh, we can add to that. I, I would think I, that as an auditor, though, and Jim raises a good point, that the, the amounts of money that the state has thrown at just the contract part of this, not, yeah. not who's on, who's legal and who isn't, but just millions and millions of dollars, it seems that Patrick just had a blank check and kept writing money to the, to the, well, to the, the people that were supposed to have the website yeah. up and running. What well, was the final cost that we? Yeah, um, it's up to two hundred and fifty. Well, well million they say two fifty. Right yeah, I would think that as the auditor, yeah, that but you'd love to sink your teeth into that one. And, um, and there are lawsuits. Yes, yes, and so we will be. But the but we have to figure out, um, you know, rather than going in and duplicating somebody right, else's right, efforts, yeah. uh, we have to bide our time and then figure out what are some of the unanswered questions mm. there, and that's how we'll no, provide that. that is, isn't most of that federal money anyway? Well, half of it. Of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, it. Actually, even I think even more than half of it is, um, which may explain sort of a, a part of the, about my, the about attitude my. about about spending the money. Um, you know, uh, just switching gears a little, you, you did a lot of work on the former uh, Merrimack Education Collaborative that is now the Valley Collaborative, right. okay? Now, uh, you identified almost $11 million in money that had been either misused or, or um, uh, in some form uh, was not used properly, the irregularities or whatever. We reported extensively on it, and yet here it is you know, three, four years later, and uh, no one has ever been indicted, or, or no federal, no charges have ever been brought. I mean, I think even, um, really? yeah. Barranco? Barranco has not, no. no he, he's still, he, no. he uh, originally the state uh, took away or uh, froze his pension, and then he went back to court, he appealed yeah. it, and he, and he won. Uh, so, uh, any update, did, did you, any update on that at all? I've that someone was pursuing Barranco on a criminal basis. Uh, well, they might be pursuing, the Attorney General yeah, might be pursuing, I, I even... Think, uh, I, think, I do think that there's an ongoing investigation. I can't swear to that, though. I could be mistaken about that. But actually, I'm glad you brought that up, because that is um, that um, audit that we did of that um, had, as you're suggesting, findings of financial mismanagement, siphoning money off into a slush fund, into a private entity, you know, cronyism, uh, pension abuse, mm. just all kinds of problems there. But you know what? That isn't the only education collaborative that right, was right. engaging in financial right. mismanagement. The Merrimack was like the poster child for bad behavior, yeah. but, uh, but that's because- That's one of the right? Yeah, that's right. So, and because, and in other places, and because um, one of the first things I did, actually, so I, I wanted to use this office to make government work better, not just to tell an individual collaborative, for instance, you're messing up, um, you, know, you need to improve your, your operations. Um, I said at one of my first staff meetings, oh, we're doing all of these audits of education collaboratives. Let's, when we're done with those audits, take a look at what the findings are, see what they, what problems they have in common, and what it says about the system of governance of special education collaboratives. Because it's the regional you know, schools come together to support these these programs to provide special education services to their students 
on a more cost-effective basis than if they were each going to try to educate that child with special needs in their, um, in their uh, school. And, uh, and, and it's less expensive than putting some, a, a child in a private placement, in a, in a, you know, in a special private, private school. Um, so we, when, when we pulled all those audits together, indeed, as I said, Merrimack was the poster child for bad behavior, but we saw that there was a system that lacked accountability to the school districts. School districts didn't have enough insight into how their assessments were being spent, how they were being governed, and the state didn't have enough ability to set standards for the operation of them. And so we made a series of recommendations um, we worked with the school superintendents association, the school committees association, and, uh, and actually an association of, um, of collaboratives, uh, because there are good ones as well, that uh, recognized that there was a problem with the system. Um, and we provided a set of recommendations to the legislature. They took those recommendations and, and within a matter of months had enacted them into law so that now there are standards to protect against cronyism, pension abuse, uh, and the like, so that special ed collaboratives are, are serving the needs of the taxpayers and the students, and not of the administrators or the board members. So th that that's, was, was a great um, uh, example of the vision that I had for the office to make those kinds of uh, fundamental changes in, in how programs are operated so that they are indeed more accountable to the taxpayers and the people that they are serving. Um, for some reason, um, my Republican uh, opponent has said, I shouldn't be doing um, this uh, again, that I should not be working with the legislature to help them understand audit findings and then try to make government work better. She hasn't articulated why that is, but I view that as, as the essential another part of the essential role of the auditor to make government work better, to earn the public trust, uh, uh, to be good stewards of right, public I'd like resources. to ask you a question about public trust. You've sure. mentioned that several times today. Yeah. Commonwealth Magazine had a small piece on you about a month ago questioning yep. your reimbursement, yep. um, questioning your what's, what appeared to be petty reimbursements, plus seeking reimbursement reimbursements to events that weren't necessarily related to your job but more to your campaign. Um, we wrote a little bit about that in the Sunday column. Can you respond to that? Or have sure. you changed the way you seek reimbursements? No, none of the expenses that they cited, and I don't know how what their criteria were, um, were campaign related. They quarreled with my um, uh, getting reimbursed for the mileage to attend a, uh, a, a, a Valentine for Veterans um, program that we did. I was the chair of the um, uh, Boston chapter, or the president of the Boston chapter of the uh, Association of Government Auditors. And one of our community uh, programs was veter Valentine's for Veterans. Um, I went to join auditors who had bought Valentine's that we were then signing with special messages in, and sending to veterans who were in VA hospitals. That was part of the job that I was doing as state auditor. Um, that was a completely justifiable expense. I was criticized for holiday wrapping party uh, at, at travel expenses. That's when I went to one of my offices, the one in Brockton, um, and participated with my staff at Christmas time in wrapping presents that they had gathered and would provide every year to Children's Hospital to make sure all of the kids had their, that was a team building holiday <laughs> exercise. They also took issue, uh, and I think that this is the one that you're probably referring to, with the fact that I charge a mileage to attend the St. Patrick's Day mm -hmm. uh, yeah, event. That was one um, of them. Mm -hmm. which, which I only attend because I am an elected official. I don't attend that, attend that as part of a campaign. Uh, you know, I didn't attend that when I was, not, um, you know, when I was not in office, that I attend in my official capacity. I'm not there because I'm funny. <laughs> I mean, I'm there because it's expected of them. And, and it doesn't matter um, when we are keeping records, whether it's a large expense or a small expense. Mm -hmm. If the policy is to separate out the personal use of my vehicle from the business use of my vehicle, 
you draw those lines and then you treat every expense accordingly, whether it's two miles or 200 miles. It's a business expense, it goes in the business pot. So we have policies, and we have procedures, we keep the records that are necessary to implement them. That is accountability. What, what is the salary of the state auditor? Uh, 137, I think. It, yeah, I can't remember, it went down. And you feel, it's you feel confident in explaining with a salary like that? You know, putting in just for a little tiny reimbursement from some there's, Boston. There's Boston. no, what there is is there's a policy and <laughs> nobody applies their independent judgment to it. So that there's no, there's no consideration. So for instance, in the beginning, I now drive my own car and I get reimbursed for the state travel. In the beginning, it was just the opposite. In the beginning, it was I had a state car, mm -hmm. and then I would pay for my personal travel. Mm -hmm. And during the three years that I had that car, I reimbursed the state more than $12,000 for the use of that car, and as well as assumed, paid all the gas and maintenance. I never said, well, gee, I'm only going a couple of miles. Why don't I just regard that as state, as state travel? You know, because because it's not. We right from the start, you separate business from personal. Doesn't matter what the distance is. Doesn't matter whether the the parking expense is seventy five cents or it's forty dollars. If it's business, it's business. If it's personal, it's personal. That's how you. Uh, or that's basic integrity and accountability in government. Nobody exercises independent judgment. I follow the rules. I want to I, I, I want to show you some of the reimbursement that I get from the reporting staff. Okay, I mean they yeah, but they're in, not making one hundred thirty-seven thousand no, dollars. No, but the the point is, if it even if it's one tenth of a mile, and I get that from certain reporters, it adds up over the course of two weeks. I mean, one tenth of a mile might become a mile at the end of two weeks, but I but you get them, you know. So yeah, but, but there's uh, absolutely none of that was political travel. None yeah. of it. Nothing campaign related. Even in those examples that, he, that were cited, none of it. Okay, uh, we, we reached that point where we're going to give you uh, one minute to uh, tell the voters why they should uh, re-elect you on November fourth. So why don't you just look right into the camera and tell people why you should be given return to the office of auditor. <laughs> so I am Suzanne Bump. I am the uh, Democratic State Auditor here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, running for re-election. When I ran in 2010, I told you that I had a plan to be your agent for accountability in state government, to oversee the proper expenditure of money and the proper use of state resources and to make sure that government is giving you the results that you deserve. Over the past four years, we've identified over $400 million worth of broken systems, misspending, waste, and fraud. I also said that I was going to use the office in order to help make government work better. And that means taking our audit findings and working with the legislature when we see the need to reform agencies. We have had that impact in public housing uh, uh, authority administration, in special education collaborative administration, in, uh, in making more effective the school anti-bullying programs, in regulating occupational and trade schools, and in many other areas. So a plan to be your agent for accountability, uh, your advocate uh, for an agent for change in, uh, in making government work better. And I've also taken over the past four years an agency that failed to meet government standards according to a State Auditors Association peer review in 2011 to one that is now achieving the highest possible uh, auditing standards in 2014. That's a record that I'm proud of. I believe that it's worthy of your support. And I ask you to consider that when you go to the voting booth, voting booth on November 4th. Thank you. Very good. Well, well thank you for coming to the sun. Thanks. I'm delighted. I'm delighted.